Okay, I'll we'll start waiting for people to join. And I don't know how this works on YouTube, so this will be a new one for me. And I do know how it works on TikTok. So we're going live on TikTok. Well, we've got some people joining. Hello. Today we're talking about food safety of large animals and food animals with uh, Doc Sanders. And he's over here. <laughs> and uh, so the first thing we're going to talk about is anybody, anybody has a question and wants to join um, is, is meat safe in this country? Big uh, question. The meat that is federally inspected is, by and large, the safest in the world. That doesn't mean there can't be some issue happen sometime. Uh, and and that not only is with meat animals, but with plants and, and uh, different things like that. Um, the uh, USDA, U.S. Department of Agriculture, has an inspection service that all major processing plants have veterinarians on staff and then technicians under them inspecting every bit of meat uh, that is processed. They also inspect these animals prior to uh, them being uh, processed uh, when they enter uh, to the, what we call the kill floor, but in essence, that's what it amounts to is it so they, so you have been doing this for over 50 years uh well not uh, meat inspection but i'm a, been a right. veterinarian for over 50 years yeah so your expertise has been taking care of uh farmers large animal vet, large animals and small animals on all animals so you went to the Ohio state university so you've got a lot of credibility you understand this stuff backwards and forwards you well, spent a lifetime with it i i have spent a lifetime with it so, and he's got all kinds of credentials behind us, um, point out. Um, and you're also a specialist in, uh, I'm always pronounced this wrong, Therian, Therian gelato. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I'm a specialist in reproduction, and it's referred to as theriogenology. It's theriogenology. Well, I might get it right one of these days. So, we're on TikTok, and we're on uh, now YouTube live so uh all you folks that are joined on tiktok welcome and we're talking about food safety um and if you have any questions uh dm or reach out and um and we'll try to get your questions answered so um dairy is dairy safe in this country we've had a lot of a lot of questions about that well let's talk about milk to start okay. with milk in the United States is the safest food supply, not only here, but in the world. Europe does not compare to the standards that American dairymen operate under. How do you know that? Uh, well, number one, I worked with dairy cattle for years and I've been involved with inspection processes with those people. And when there is an issue on a farm, uh, if I'm the farm veterinarian, I step in and ensure that an animal that has an issue doesn't end up in the food supply and gets appropriate treatment and diagnostics and things like that. So is milk full of hormones and uh, um, antibiotics and what have you? Uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit of both. And hear me out on this. Okay. And Pay attention, is, folks. And that is milk in its natural form has antibodies in it and has uh, white blood cells and this sort of thing. That's a normal component of milk. Now, the thing is, if a cow becomes gets an infection, those white bells, white blood cell numbers might go from twenty five or thirty thousand to a million, and that's not safe. Right. 
And so here's what happens. Let's talk about the safety side of this first. And that is a dairyman is milking their cows and the larger herds are usually milking them three times a day uh, around the clock and they get a break to go eat and they want them to have 14 hours to lay down. And so that, cause they know they'll give more milk if they give them those kind of rest periods. So happy cows are, are better cows. Yes. Yes. And these cows then uh, are uh, in a milking parlor or in a robot parlor. There are actually robot systems milking cows today. And the, either the, employee is checking each teat. Cows have four teats uh, that attach to their mammary gland. And before a... Those big things underneath, which are utterly ridiculous, right? <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. Uh, so the thing is, uh, every one of those cows prior to prep is checked to see if they've got any infection and you know that kind of issue and then they are prepped uh, with uh, if if they need to be washed they get washed on their teeth if they don't need to be washed then they still get disinfected with either a quarter or a half percent iodine or there are some new products that are along that same line as far as sanitizers and then the sanitizer is wiped off and a one squirt of milk is squirted out on the floor to ensure that there wasn't anything in that milk that would be uh, unhealthy. And the milking equipment then is attached to the cow and the uh, operator uh, or operators, because some of the large parlors will hold 80 cows. And we were, we were I wanna just jump in here Three weeks ago, we were at an uh, operation where they were milking a thousand cows every, twice a day. Yes. And uh, there was two guys and it was a big round parlor. You can see that uh, on on uh, my previous videos, uh, long form. So, yeah. Yeah. And we were visiting there. And so there's su human supervision going on through that process uh, and attaching the milkers. And then they have... Uh, usually an automatic takeoff system that when the cow is uh, finished letting her milk down, uh, the unit is removed from the cow. And before she leaves this uh, area that she's being milked in, it can be either a stanchion or a stall or in a carousel. Before she leaves, her teats are sanitized before she uh, goes out back out into the barn. It's amazing to me that we saw that um, almost what seventy five percent of of dairy dairy now are a thousand herds or more or a thousand head or more. Yes. In their in their milking situation, and those cows, you told me that those cows receive just as good, if not better, care in those large operations as they do in some of the smaller operations, which are like 40, 50, 60. Head. Well, there aren't hardly any 40 or 50 head ones around anymore, but there's certainly some 100, 125 cow herds around. And in general, these large herds with the thousands of cows are getting better care than the small herd uh, with one individual operator that's doing everything. I mean, he's... Uh, he's overwhelmed. Yeah, he's a little bit overwhelmed with what's going on. So... I know when I was growing up, one of my first jobs was was, was in, a, in a dairy farm where he milked, I don't know, 30 or 40 cows. I can't remember. And now the, the it, it, it's almost unheard of for that, as you said. We yeah. have, in our little area, we have one or two small milking operations, and they sell right. their milk in a, in, a whole, in a retail situation. Right. And they make cheese and ice cream and uh and they pasteurize their own milk and, and they sell the milk right yeah so right. and you can see that on also uh that's it uh todd woodruff's dairy so if you want to go learn about that so it's amazing to me um how well how well they do right but i'm I, I i don't know that much about it so anyway so we talked about dairy so dairy's safe we know that 
all that milk that and the, the operations that we saw, which there were two farms and they did 2,300 cows. One did 1,000. The other one did 1,300. Right. Twice a day. Um, all that went to uh, to to a, a company that makes yogurt. Right. So anyway, and I reached out to that company and uh, we may hear more about that. Make a good right. talk to them. Right. But anyway, so American milk is some of the safest in the world. Um, and and what about this question of whether it's whether it's pasteurized or not pasteurized? Um, the uh, in my vernacular, I believe that milk should be pasteurized just on the off chance there's some little risk of something contaminating that milk in the process. And yet some people uh, believe that raw milk is better for them. And uh, nutritionally, I, I honestly don't believe there's a lot of difference as far and as... And you've looked at it pretty life. hard all your life. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I've, uh, so, okay. So we've talked about milk. How about eggs? You, you've, you've dealt with chickens. And, right. and uh, so uh, raw eggs, I mean, do they pasteurize eggs? I mean, how does that all work? Uh, they can pasteurize eggs and they frequently do. But not all eggs are pasteurized. So if you go into a large grocery store, those are probably be pasteurized. That's right. And I've heard tell that those sit on sit in refrigeration for weeks at a time. Is that true? They could, although I, I believe that most large groceries that have a turnover as far as food that they, they don't want they, them sitting. That's right. And they want to turn them over. It doesn't right. make good business sense to right. have products sitting for weeks and weeks. Right. Right. So how about if you go to a farmer's market and you buy eggs at a farmer's market? Are you are you reasonably safe? Well, I can't answer that because it's important to know where those eggs came from. OK, so you build a relationship with your farmer at the farmer's market. And right. ask, what are some of the questions I would ask? Well, I ask if you go out and, and visit his farm, yep. vis visit the operation. What are you looking for? Oh, well, it's cleanliness. Is it clean? Yeah. They keep the keep the keep the manure under control. Yes, right. So let's talk about something that I, I I know that some people are aghast, and a lot of people. When I went to school for the first time in a large city, a lot of people didn't really have any clue as to how meat came about, and uh, they were pretty appalled when I told them how 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 meat comes about. But there's been a lot of work done. And in essence, we're talking about a gal who is autistic in order to keep, keep, keep that. Band. And you actually met, what's, what was her name? Uh, it was, so now you've caught me off oh, guard. Okay. I couldn't, I couldn't uh, remember her name either. I, I'll tell you in a bit, but in essence, uh, she uh, designed systems that were very comfortable for cattle as far as, uh, when they were going to a processing plant and this sort of thing to make the cattle less fearful. And she designed stand, uh, uh, means for uh, the way they should be handled on the farm and how much rest time they should get. Temple Grandin's her name. Temple. I just got there. I was looking it up on my phone. Yeah, Temple Grandin. And she's, she's been doing this for many, many years. Is she still active? Uh, she, I think she's mostly retired now. She's, yeah. uh, She's about as old as I am, I think, and uh, and I'm not ready to be retired. But yeah, uh, but she she's autistic, and very high she functioning. Could, yes, and she could identify with the panic of a animal being put in a cattle chute, going to the packing plant, or on a truck, or the way they were handled. And she wrote a series of books about. Uh, how to make these cattle more comfortable and like, and she was a, one of the foremost experts in the world on uh, cattle behavior and uh, how to keep them comfortable and not have them panic at when. Well, panic cows that. doesn't make for good meat. No, no, they don't. What, what, what happens if a, if an animal is upset? Um, you had shared that with me previously. What happens when an animal? Well, upset? The, the adrenaline flows and, they uh, have uh, catecholamines that's released into their muscles uh, and uh, things like that. And as a result, uh, the, when that's been going on for just a little bit, uh, the meat becomes very tough. 
and uh, you know, and it's not near as edible or tasty when they've had that kind of stress on them. So it it behooves us to 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 when when we process animals for meat, it is very much much in the interest of the animal and and the consumer that that animal is comfortable. It and all the calm. way and comfortable and calm all the way through the process. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So uh, I know, I, I know I've seen some process. Okay. So are diseased animals allowed into that process? Are, are an animal that can't walk or an animal that's got some problem? Um, are they allowed into that process? It, it depends. And I'm going to tell you some examples of what it is. And that is number one is, is that these animals must be inspected what's called anti-mortem. In other words, before they're put down, uh, they're inspected to determine that they're not going to be a safety issue, health safety issue uh, that way. And then when they're slaughtered uh, and processed, that uh, carcass is often pushed off onto a separate rail for the meat inspector to give it individual attention as far as what's there. Now, for instance, if a cow has a broken leg or something like that, why, with the exception of where the fracture is, that meat will be able to be used. Uh, on the other hand, if a cow has a big abscess in her muscles or something on that order, uh, that's another story. She very well, at least that part of the cow will get condemned or if it involves a, a lot of her and there is a type of leukemia that occurs in cows. Uh, and if she's got that, I can tell you, she positively will not end up in the food chain. And so tuberculosis is something else. That's right. Tuberculosis between bovine, and, and help me if I get this wrong, bovine tuberculosis and human tuberculosis, which used to be known as consumption. Yes. Um, that's, that's a big issue too. Right. Now, let me, let me share a story with you. Okay. And that is that uh, one of the largest herds in the country that high profile, noted for their genetics and this sort of thing, and I think they maybe had 5,000 cows. Oh, my gosh. In, in California. And they were superb caretakers of their cattle. I mean, this, they, nothing was too good for their cattle, the way they took care of them. And they ended up, uh, and they had Hispanic employees to help with the work. And the, uh, there's a lot of uh, Mexicans and Guatemalans and this sort of thing here that are here. Do an outstanding earn. job of yes. taking care of yes. taking yes. taking care of, of the agriculture. And that's a big plus for this country. Right. Big plus. And so the thing is, these uh, uh, they had of this 5,000 cows, they had 60 of them test positive for tuberculosis. Well, that automatically puts the herd in quarantine. They couldn't sell milk. They couldn't sell meat or anything. And they proceeded to test every animal and determine those that truly had symptoms and those that didn't. And those that didn't, well, they all went to slaughter. Uh, but those that didn't have symptoms, why they... Uh, checked them over very thoroughly, and they had to pass two negative TB tests, intradermal tests, for it. And it ultimately got done. Of these 5,000 cows, the farmer had 60 cows left that did not have to go to slaughter. So that was that's pretty devastating. But he knows that his reputation is on the line, so he's going to be very attentive to that. Well, here, here's the punchline to that story. Yeah. So there, he had good quarantine facilities. He was very careful about the way he did things. And uh, they isolated the strain of TB. They isolated that strain. And when they got it tracked down, they discovered it was a human strain. And so they tested all the workers. And one of his workers had tuberculosis that had given it to his cows. So it, I, I would imagine workers now working around farm animals now have to be tested for tuberculosis. Well, that often is the case. Yeah. yeah. It isn't true everywhere, but it is. But tuberculosis is still an active program that veterinarians go to farms and test cattle and 
uh, where there is a risk of tuberculosis. You're, you're not retired, but you're not seeing large animals anymore. Uh, well, I, I do see animals, but I'm not doing treatments and diagnoses. And Understood. I'm doing expert opinions and giving advice and that kind of thing. Right. And you're working on some court cases right now. I am. Yeah. So anyway. Uh, okay. So uh, we've got about 10 more minutes and uh, see if we have any questions there. All right. So we've talked about dairy. Dairy is incredibly safe in this country. That's right. Yep. And there are um, hormones and antibodies, but those are the result of a natural occurrence within the cow. That's right. Yep. Now, let's talk about human mothers with babies. Right. They also have antibodies. And hormones. And hormones in their milk. Yes. And so. This is important. Yeah. And this, uh, so somebody spazzes out because the cow's got hormones. Well, hey, that's a normal thing. And, uh, and I can tell you that when a dairyman has a cow that he believes has a health problem, particularly related to her mammary gland, she is pulled out from a milking string and he collects a sample of her milk and goes and tests it to see what's there and a diagnosis. And she is uh, held out of the milking string until the infection's cleared up and the antibiotics have disappeared. And one of the things I saw, one of the things they told us at the dairy farm, the uh, 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 tune and, and, um, um, uh, Rick and yeah. um, uh, Gordy, Gordy, yeah, is that that not only is the milk tested uh, as it comes from the cow, but it's tested at various stages along the place, along the way. Let, let me share that. Sure. With, uh, and that is that so the cow is tested when they think she's got a problem and they check to make sure she's clear of that problem before she goes back in the tank. The milk hauler that picks up the trailer tractor trailer load of milk tests the milk in the bulk tank before he pumps it on his truck. And if it tests positive, he won't take the milk. Yeah. So that's 55 to 60 or thousand pounds of milk that they have to get rid of. Yes. They have yeah. to dump. So. And so the milk hauler, he, uh, now he's not going to want to screw up because he hauls it to the plant, to the processing plant. And they won't let him unload until they test the milk again to make sure there isn't something on his truck that's uh, contaminated. So they have to clean out every load. They clean out those tanks yes. carefully right. and thoroughly. And so you've got a good, you've got good milk. You've got a good uh, trail of healthy milk all the way to the, all the way to whoever is putting it in jugs. Well, or, let's, or uh, let's talk about right that point. Okay. So, it goes into a big silo at the plant when it's cleared. And before they start bottling the milk, the plant inspector tests the milk again to make sure. So it's tested four times before it ever goes to the grocery store. So when you get it from the grocery store and there's a problem with it, um, it's very unlikely that it came from the bottler may, may have came in the store or, or, or well, something along those if ways. they're selling raw milk or they've got their own little bottling operation uh, there on the premises. It could be from something like that. But I can tell you that positively American milk is the safest food in the world. And you've traveled the world and seen it. Yes, I have. You've much. been to, you've been, you've, you've helped provide consulting and direction and training to milk operations from Mongolia to China, to Ukraine, to Russia, to Poland, right? Uh, South America, South America, Colombia. Uh, Colombia. You even the World Bank even contracted you, to you to go inspect uh, dairy operations in what was called FARC country, which is where the, the drug rebels is. and drug cartels are. Yeah. So, and you were concealed carry, right? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> so, well, maybe you were anyway. So, probably I wouldn't. Yeah. Anyway. Not, not a joking matter. So, so our, our, our milk is safe. Our milk products are safe. Um, nothing's perfect though. That, that's true. Yep. As long as we're dealing with, with human, nothing is perfect. So the meat is also uh, very carefully monitored in this country. That's right. That's right. 
and uh, I don't know how many people read uh, um, uh, back in the 1860s and 70s and 80s, there was considerable problems with meat in this yeah, country. Right. Yeah. Right. Mass process. Broke. And so, so how would you say uh, in terms of quality of meat and, and the and the safety of the meat in this country, how would you compare it to other other locations? It's by far better than any place else. Now, the exception to that rule is you make sure the meat you're purchasing says that it's grown and produced here in the United States because there are uh, animals that are imported to be processed and they can sell that cheaper. And so sometimes the cheaper cuts. Uh, so, yeah. So, okay. So you should look for meat made in the, and it should say that right on the label. That's right. Okay. Um, obviously, if you go to a farmer's market, you're going to know the farmer and you're going to know, I do, when I go to the farmer's market or where I get some something processed locally, um, you know, I, there's, there's, there's integrity. I know where the food integrity is. Right. So, um, so if you go to a farmer's market, you, you know, if you're in, if you're in Philadelphia at the farmer's market, they have to be, they have to follow some pretty good rules over there because right. that's, that's, that's different. So, so the food integrity and uh, the meat, uh, the cheese, um, the chickens. Um, so we, we've heard a lot about salmonella and chicken and, um, and, and that's, we've, we've heard a lot about people processing chicken that, um, you know, uh, the, you know, a lot of big news stories about that. So how safe is chicken? Chicken is as safe as the person preparing it, meaning that it needs to be thoroughly cooked all the way through. It doesn't dare be a little bit, as you'd call like a hamburger, medium rare, something like that. You don't dare do that because there could be salmonella that could be a problem. So it has to be cooked uh, very appropriately and well. And by the way, that's true of hamburger as well. Think about, uh, I'm going to talk about two things. Number one is if you talk about a steak and you throw it on the grill and you braise it on the top and the bottom good, and the center of it can be pink and it's perfectly safe to eat because those internal surfaces were never exposed to the outside environment. And the outside environment was on the part that was cooked. And the cow is safe because we know they're inspected anti-mortem. Yes. And then post-mortem. Right. And then when they are labeled and put uh, ready to display. Now, the exception to this is hamburger. Because think about that. That's all the little pieces of meat, the trimmings that didn't go into that steak. And they literally grind it up uh, to make hamburger. And... That, they, that has a lot of surfaces inside the hamburger and outside the hamburger where a steak only has two surfaces, the top and the bottom and maybe the edges. So a hamburger should not be medium rare. Oh, positively not. That's a sure way to get sick. So a hamburger should be cooked all the way through. That's right. Yeah. So 100, of 160, 65 it, degrees. That's right. Yeah. Everybody okay. says they want it medium rare. And that is positively perfect to do with a steak, but it is really serious threat if you do it on a hamburger. Okay, all right. So we've. Uh, I know my my uh, the mother of my children and I. Uh, there are certain places we don't like to buy meat because we notice that they change colors, and some of the meat seems to be adulterated. Can you speak to that? Are, are, are grocery stores or meat processors adding things to keep the color of the meat? Do you know? Uh, I can't really answer about the colors uh, as far as them putting something on it to do that. I can tell you that uh, sometimes the meat that's imported from someplace else are going to be a little bit different color. And if it's a local market that is uh, doing their own processing, that could be an issue, and it's simple. You make sure you cook that meat good, well done, and if, it's safe. Then, if it if it doesn't pass the smell test, don't use it. That's right. Yep. So common sense rules, right? right. For food safety, right? Right. Yep. 
Okay. Well, we are at the end of our time, and we've had on TikTok, we've had a nice, lovely crowd. And on uh, YouTube, I haven't figured that out. We haven't had anybody, as far as I know. So anyway, so all you folks on TikTok, thank you for joining us. And we will be back again next week. Uh, maybe we'll be live somewhere, uh, or we'll be just sitting here um, talking animals with Doc Sanders. By the way, Doc has a book, and it's called Beyond the Barn. And uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful book. It's one of the 11th book that you've written. Right. And uh, you've not only written 11 books, but you had 94 scientific uh, papers and uh, <laughs> yes. all kinds of stuff. And you've written a column and you've traveled the world. And uh, this guy really knows his stuff. And it's a wonderful, wonderful book. Give me just a sec. I'm going to grab one so everybody can see what it looks like. I'll tell you where it is because, like I said, it's a wonderful, wonderful book, and we've had lots of very positive, very positive. Um, there you can see it. It's a good read. It's like 360 pages, and it's all true stories of your time as a veterinarian. The only thing it isn't true is I changed the names of the guilty. Of the innocent and the guilty, right? Yes, right. Right. So there's some wonderful, and if you look at uh, if you look at on my channel, you can see some of those stories there, and you can buy this book at Vaca Resources, V A C A Resources.com, or you can go on Amazon.com and buy it uh, also. So if you look up Beyond the Barn, um, fifty uh, dodging the cow patties for fifty years as a country vet. It's a classic, classic book. I think it's going to be uh, as good as all creatures. Uh, great and small. Uh, so with that, we're going to end. And thank you, everybody, for joining on the TikTok side. And one of these days, I'll figure out the YouTube side. So it's brand new. So thank you. And reach out, direct message me if you have any questions or comments, what have you. Bye now. And we're turning off. I think we're turning off. And well, end stream. There we go. And well, I'm glad nobody.